Here's an interesting and fun kind of model of, uh, I've been playing with for a little while and just would be worth showing you because it involves a couple of things including the modeling and simulation and so on and so forth. And it also involves things that I found on my desk uh, that I thought might be good. So this spring from a motorbike uh, is sitting right next to me and it's been tempting me to model and simulate. So that's what I'm going to do. So I'll show you how I did it. Um, here's the spring itself. And the way that I did it, and there's many ways you could do this, was to use a really nice custom feature that we have called the parametric uh, curve. Um, now, I actually have a modification of the parametric curve which uses uh, a new feature script function which is approximate splines. Uh, but I'll show you this one anyway. Um, basically, with this custom feature, uh, which you can, it's a public one, you can find this. Uh, you can create a curve through equa equations and they can be parametricized in, in different coordinate systems. Um, so here I've got a uh, Cartesian and cylindrical or spherical coordinate system and it makes sense for this uh, to be a, spheric, uh, a cylindrical coordinate system. So I put in here um, the r theta and z, um, z function and R is going to be a constant, which is the diameter of the spring divided by two. Now, I use variables for all of this, so you'll see that there's a number of variables over here. Number of turns, the length, the wire diameter, all of those things are set as variables, and these ones are to do with the spline that comes later, uh, but let's not worry about that. So the first equation, another very simple one, is the theta uh, equation, um, which is uh, the expression here, which is 360 degrees, multiplied by the number of turns divided by 2t times the um, and turn it into degrees right so a uh, pretty simple expression for theta it's a circle right and in the z direction there's a function which is slightly more tricky um, because i want to create this variable pitch nature of it and you'll see here um, it looks like the old test pattern that was on an oscilloscope or a tv unit Interesting. Actually, I actually have another example of those Lissajou um, curves. Uh, anyway, this is not one of them. This is just varying the z direction, which is here, here up, um, according to a function, uh, which includes a cosine um, part of the expression. Uh, you can see it in there. Uh, so I'm just, you know, see the z direction will be length divided by 2, because I'm doing this in two halves, uh, and then multiplying it by um, what the cosine of 90t t is a parameter, this is a parameterized uh, form of the equation, and t varies between 0 and minus 2. Um, the reason it goes minus is that I want to go in a right-hand thread uh, direction, like if I change this to 2, uh, then I would um, have a left-hand thread spring, and looking at this guy over here, it, you can see here this is a right-hand thread. Anyway, so that's the equation for this curve, and you know, clearly then uh, you would sweep a, the cross-section, uh, which is uh, here, there's a cross-section um, there, which is going to be the, uh, the wire diameter. Again, all of these things are linked to uh, variables over here. What is really cool before we get to that, and actually if I roll back uh, to here, I'll show you a, a little bit of a verification calculation uh, that I did with the information that we already have. Um, so in this folder of features, uh, I use feature folders quite extensively so you can hide things away and call it something that makes sense like verification. I put in some very interesting and, and useful things like the uh, Poisson's ratio, uh, the elastic modulus. Um, I calculate the shear modulus here and the shear modul modulus, you can, if, you, if you just go over to the variable um, table, and expand this out again. You'll see here's some constants I put in. This is calculated uh, from a well-known formula. Um, and then I can calculate the stiffness of the spring uh, according to another well-known formula, which is uh, the shear modulus times the wire diameter of the fourth power divided by eight times the diameter of the um, cubed uh, multiplied by number of turns that are active. Now, because the springs uh, like this one here, you see that this spring actually closes for that first turn. There's only actually, uh, there's n turns uh, minus two that are actually active in the spring. So that's why there's that term uh, at the end there, um, which is the turns minus two. 
That actually gives a value um, here, and it's in a strange set of units, but that's okay uh, because that is the equivalent of uh, newtons per millimeter, and that's the stiffness of the spring. So I just created this extra one here uh, to divide it by the appropriate um, amount to get the newtons per min uh, millimeter. Now you can just type in, uh, you know, here if you just do a, a sort of a test and put an any uh, variable type on it, and if you type in 98 newtons, you'll see here the uh, the, um, the that's 98 newtons. The units of here are the equivalent of the one above it to, uh, if you divide this one by millimeters. Hence, the one above is actually, in fact, newtons per millimeter, i.e., the stiffness of the spring. Now. So then I just simply swept that down and then I created um, a couple of things for my simulation. And again, I've hidden them away in the fixtures folder. And what I did is just create this sort of cylindrical lump that I'm going to use as kind of like a, a tooling um, when I put this into an assembly, which is what I've done over here. So our simulation, as I've probably pointed out a few times before, is very simple and physically based. Um, you know, I put in a fixture at the bottom um, and then I fixed that to ground. Uh, so I did that by just saying right click, saying fix it, and it shows you the fix uh, indication here. Uh, I got the spring then and I have fastened it. And the way that I fastened it is I used mate connectors. Uh, the mate connectors are um, also in the spring part. Uh, I'll just jump back there and show you that. Um, I've hidden some of these things as part of the fixtures. Um, so on the spring itself, I have these two mate connectors which are you know, on the plane at the top and in center. Um, I did that because it's, it, you can't really pick this one on the fly because that's not, uh, that's a, uh, not a uh, circular shape. Um, so I did this early on and just calculated the, the max and min uh, heights of that spring based off obviously these uh, parameters over, and variables over here. Anyway, that gives me an easy way to fasten the two uh, fixtures, the one that's at the top, which will be doing the loading, and the one that's at the bottom, which is doing the holding. And that's pretty much it. You know, I create a load, uh, a force, uh, in the form of a force. And that's very simple. You know, you do a force, pick the instance, uh, pick the direction that that force is going to be on. You know, you can flip it around and put the value in. Now, Using variables is not just for part studios anymore. You can actually do global variables that can be used in any of uh, part studios and assemblies. Uh, um, so we call it, you know, maybe you want to call them global variables, but we obviously do this in the form of a variable studio. And so I've created a variable called load uh, and just entered in this 97.959 um, newtons per millimeter as the stiffness of the spring. And that will then allow it to be used. If I look at the variable uh, table here, you can see this variable is now available for me. And I can use that variable in, in whatever way that I need. And you know, if it was a length or, or an angle, I could use it for positioning or offsetting a mate connector or in, in fact the mate itself. Uh, there's many reasons why you want to uh, use numbers or distances or angles, or in this case, a force, uh, the load. So um, you can see in this one, I've actually, it says 98 in there, but it's actually coming from the, the hash load, which is the name of the variable load over here. Um, just makes it very, very convenient for me to, uh, you know, to be able to adjust this and, and have the, uh, the simulation update. Uh, talking of the simulation, uh, let's have a look at the simulation panel. Um, I have one load on this model. It's a linear static analysis. Um, I am primarily interested in displacement of this, so I'm going to use a blue to red, uh, very friendly for displacement style um, output post-processing, whatever. The connectivity, you want to check this, uh, I'm going to use the mates. Um, some people kind of don't bother looking at this, but you probably should, right, because there might be a place um, where two faces are very, very close to touching and that will automatically fuse them if you have this first option like this. Uh, but I only want to use the mates. Uh, you can preview those connections uh, just by using this show connections 
um, option here. And what it's going to do is go through and compute where those connections might be. And it's going to show you in this color coding way um, everything that is fastened. And you can see the footprint or the shadow where the, these fastenings have occurred. Now, this is really, really useful when you have more complicated assembly setups where you might have sliders and cylindrical and revolutes and all sorts of other things going on. And you want to use that to check uh, to make sure that things are, in fact, kinematically joined in the way that you expect. Um, that being said, let's just show the results. Um, so what it's going to do now is create the simulation, set it up, start the solver, and start bringing results back in. Now, while the results are coming back in, you can actually preview. Um, it's not fully um, converged yet. Uh, you can have a look at, say, displacement. Um, and you see here, it isn't symmetric, as the spring is not symmetric. Um, and that's fine. What we're looking for is uh, the final result, which is now it's finished. And I'll stop that animation. Maybe we will hide this fixture on the top. Uh, we can leave the one on the bottom. And as we roll the mouse over, you'll see, you know, that uh, the value of the displacement is prompted there or is, is hinted there um, at one, um, one point, not much. Um, you know, it changes a little bit as you go across the surface because this isn't, uh, isn't symmetrical. But essentially, this is just a quick check uh, to see that indeed our rough calculation, which was done over here using first principles, um, this verification here that said that this spring would have a one millimeter displacement uh, with the applied load of 97.959 newtons. And this is telling us that indeed uh, theories are close enough. <laughs> and, um, you know, there's a lot of sources of error. Um, you know, that close, completely closed spring at the top is not exactly one. Um, so the number of turns on here is not exactly six minus two. Um, so that's going to be a source of error. There's material property sources of error. Uh, there's also the, you know, the fact that this, um, you know, that the asymmetry in this whole thing uh, means that it's not quite as simple. So, you know, we can go further than this and maybe uh, in, in, another, um, in another branch, what I've actually done is look at whether we control the motion so that it is perfectly vertical, you know, by having some kind of shock, uh, almost like a, a guide tube to it. So this is now starting to put it into maybe a more realistic sense um, or, you know, of tooling uh, that, that, uh, that might exist for some kind of test machine uh, where the force is applied purely in the Z direction and the displacement is only allowed to be in the Z direction. Um, but, yeah. Regardless, it's, a, it's an interesting little setup here um, showing some pretty cool parametric modeling in Onshape as well as uh, the associated simulations that might go on with that.